50 year horizon. The 50 year horizon was coined as a phrase by Arthur C. Clarke. And what he was trying to get at is it's very difficult to make predictions about the future. Five years is okay. Ten years, yeah, stretching it a little bit. 25 years, ooh. 50 years is the absolute limit. Beyond that, it does become science fiction again. Because the issue is, is that um, beyond that, there's so many variables and so many new things that we learn uh, that uh, we just can't really reasonably predict beyond that point. That said, I'm going to have an attempt later. I'm going to make 10 predictions of what could happen between now and the year 2050, 2060. Okay? And I'll explain some of the reasons behind that. So, but first of all, I want to talk about the science of today. How many people, and it's probably an unfair question because you're here for a reason, but how many people actually used to think that science is old, still think that science is really dull, and it's about people with really dodgy beards and bad tasting jackets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Just me. <laughs> uh, science today is amazing. It is, it is the most exciting field to be in. Because as fast as science fiction writers can dream something up, scientists go, ah ah, one up. Right? Because science is advancing at such a rate now. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about science today, um, we're going to make some predictions, <coughs> we're going to have a break, and then when we come back we'll open it up to the kind of questions and anywhere that you want to take the discussion we can go. Okay, does that sound fair? Then we'll bring it back uh, to some last thoughts. The purpose of today then, just bear this in mind, is, is not to make scientific experts. The stuff I'm going to talk about will be Superficial is the wrong word, but it, it, at least it will give you a grounding in some of the concepts that we're going to talk about. But I'll tell you what, you'll be able to impress the hell out of your mates at dinner parties and uh, at the pub. Yeah? Because a lot of the stuff is just going to be able to drop in conversation and it'll be really cool. Okay. Um, but what I really want to do today is, is to get you to start thinking about asking questions. <coughs> you know, questions are, are so important and it's something that we, we're not really encouraged to do that often today. And I want to change that. I want you to get thinking about questions. And not just for tonight. And I want you to, to change the paradigm of questions as well. I don't want you to start thinking, oh, I need to think outside the box. I rather want you to think, there is no box. Okay? Apologies to the Wachowski brothers. Yeah? Because there is no spoon. Yeah? Okay. Right. So, uh, that's really important. I do have an aspiration, however, that you'll enjoy tonight so much that you will want to study science. Okay? Because it's, it's cool. It really is the new hip. Okay? Um, and I know I'm too old to use those words, but bear with me. And you'll see that learning <laughs> is fun, and I want you to sign up to other classes. There are classes here that the community college run, I want you to find out about those. Um, we've got a couple of people from Northern College, I don't know how many of you are aware of Northern College, um, but some of the courses that they run are fantastic, and it is not like any place you have ever thought about learning in before. It is not a traditional university or college, it is, it's like going on holiday. Okay, the culture and the courses, it's just brilliant. So, find out about non college and the kind of courses they run. Um, <coughs> and I really want you to go on and question everything and become the next generation parliamentarians because, let's face it, the parliamentarians from our generations have not done a good job. And we need to change that. Okay, I'll be getting a knock on the door at some point, I'll be getting the idea. Before I start the main lecture, I want to come back to this quote that was on the screen when you walked in. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Okay? Because, trust me, some of the stuff we're going to go through tonight will have you thinking, this is just made up stuff, it can't possibly be real. Nothing I'm going to talk about tonight is not... No, that's really bad English. <laughs> there isn't anything that I'm going to talk about tonight that isn't based on true scientific principle. Okay, so let's start the science of today. Oh, and something I forgot to add. This is my law. Okay? Everything I'm going to talk about during this lecture will be out of date by the time I finish it. Because knowledge, our knowledge is increasing at such a rate. When I first started doing these talks around 20 years ago, our knowledge of everything was doubling every 20 years. That's 20 years ago. Our knowledge is now doubling every five years. Now think about that. The rate at which we are doubling everything we know is also increasing at an exponential rate. So this is my law. So stuff that was correct when I put this presentation and lecture together last week may not be correct next week, but that's why you need to keep learning and you need to keep researching. So let's do the science of today. And I thought I'd start off with the thing that really made science, <coughs> brought science into the mo modern age, and that was Einstein's <coughs> theory of relativity. Now, have we all heard of relativity? Do we know what it is? Would you like to find out what it is? Yeah? 
Believe it or not, this fantastic concept that completely changed our understanding of how the universe works and gave us satellites and the ability to uh, send um, man into space and rockets out the uh, solar system <coughs> and calculate planetary orbits and whether another asteroid that's coming is really going to hit the planet you know, at some point. Um, came out five simple questions. And the first question was, what time is it? Einstein was really bored at work, as we all get sometimes. And he said, what time is it? And he looked at the clock and he said, five past twelve. And then his next question was, how do I know what time it is? The light hits the clock, reflects off the clock, and it, it enters my eyes, and that's how I know what time it is. Okay. Third question, then, he let his imagination run a little bit, and he said, what would I see if I was on that beam of light? And he supposed that he might see the second hand slow right down, or in fact, even stop. And he thought about that for a moment, and what would that mean? And then he asked two more questions. What would I see if I was travelling faster than the speed of light? And the answer that he came up with, he imagined, would be, I might see the second hand go backwards. Now here's the fifth question, and this was the crucial one, given the insight into relativity. Would I really see time move backwards, or would that just be my relative perception? Now there's not a person in this room who couldn't have asked those five questions. Yeah? They have five very simple questions. True, he had some scientific knowledge of which to be able to actually then formulate uh, <laughs> relativity. And relativity has become this huge, humongous subject that covers uh, theory of gravity, time, time dilation. It projects that light is the limiting factor of the, of the universe. You can't travel faster than the speed of light. E equals mc squared, which gave us atomic power, came out of relativity. The fact that mass and energy are interchangeable. Yeah? So what I want to do is strip away all that and get to the core. And there's something called Occam's raising. You just have to pick him for a moment. Seems to blow up. <laughs> Not very pleasant, I know, but <coughs> so far. right. So Occam's razor is basically the idea that we cut everything away and we keep cutting and cutting and cutting until we get to the, the smallest indivisible thing. And whatever remains is the core truth of um, any truth or system. There's some chairs down there if you want to come down here. You haven't missed much. Okay? So, let's strip everything away and talk about relativity. And for those of you who've been to my time travel talk, you must keep stumped for this one, okay? Right, so let's explain relativity. And what I'm going to do, as most people are at this side of the room, I'm going to take this away again. Okay. This is brain frying, brain, brain frying lesson number one. Right. Okay. So this is Mars. You'll have to forgive my drawing if you want. I'm really rubbish at drawing, so just bear with me. Okay? This is Mars. That's the Earth. Out here somewhere is Jupiter. These are not to scale before anyone <laughs> criticizes me. Okay? And what happens is it's basically at, uh, at 12 or 5 Earth time, I get on a spaceship to fly to Earth because I've got a really important meeting. Okay? On Earth. And uh, my colleague has a meeting on Jupiter, so she leaves at 12 or 5 Earth time as well, on the spaceship heading the other way. At 12.15, so that's 12 or 5, okay? So at 12.15 Earth time, the Earth blows up. Don't know why, just, okay, gone. Into a cinder, okay? So that's 12.15 Earth time. At 12.20 Earth time, on the ship that's flying towards the Earth, I see the Earth blow up. Okay? Following it so far? Yeah? Because we have to wait for light to reach us from the explosion. People on Mars see the Earth blow up at 12.35 Earth time. The people on the spaceship heading away from Earth see the Earth blow up at 12.50 Earth time. And the people on Jupiter see the Earth blow up at 1.30 Earth time. What time did the Earth blow up? Anyone? Anyone? Apart from people seeing the time talk. I can see John's bursting to give the answer. <laughs> Any guesses, anyone? Go on. 11.55. 11.55, no. I'm going to talk to you later about where you came up with that answer. Anyone? The truth is, is that the Earth broke at all those times. All those times are correct because at its core, what relativity tells us 
is that the time and location of an event is dependent on the relative position of the observer. That's all relativity is. If you strip everything else away, that is the simple truth that relativity gives us. And that was the fundamental insight to how the universe works that no one had ever even anticipated would be true until Einstein came along. Okay. Now, has that fried any brains yet? There is no absolute time, and we need to get away from that thinking. So when your boss starts giving you a hard time about you having an extended lunch break, just point out that you know, there is no absolute time. <laughs> so, we have another theory that's equally as successful, and that's quantum physics. Now, if relativity works on a very large scale, yeah, quantum physics works on the subatomic scale. So you know what I mean by that? Yeah, clear? <coughs> and quantum physics unifies three forces of the universe. The electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. Don't worry about this. We're not going to go into this in any detail. Just know that these forces are fundamental to the fact that the universe would not have formed as it has without those forces being in place. They create coalescence. They create interaction. Without them, um, the universe would have just been a big empty space full of particles zipping around. But there's one force missing from that. Can anyone think what it is? Force that's missing? What's the force we all experience every day? Gravity. Gravity. Okay. Quantum physics cannot, at the moment, incorporate a theory, a working theory of gravity. Relativity does. But here's the problem. The two theories, although they're highly successful as standalone theories, are completely inc incompatible. Especially when you take them back to the dawn of the universe. Okay. Everything just breaks down and the mass just doesn't work. So we have a problem with that. And the other problem that we have is that quantum physics has a logic. How many people have heard about the woo-woo stuff that you get in quantum physics? About the fact that you can be in more than one place at the same time? And in some conditions you can even be in every place in the universe at the same time? In theory I could do that and at some point my hand would pass straight through the table. In theory. Yeah? Because it has a logic, but that logic flies in the face of what we perceive to be common sense. Now, if we get time in the discussion, I've actually got some quantum mechanical equations that I'd like a volunteer to come and work with me on. Okay, just to show you how these maths uh, really work. But there's been a, a, an, exper an experiment recently, which has really kind of brought forth all the different kinds of issues about relativity and quantum physics. Does anyone know what it is? The experiment, the recent results? The cause of stir, CERN. CERN, and neutrinos. I heard someone say neutrinos. Yeah. There's an experiment that's gone on. A group called Opera fired some neutrinos from CERN to a, 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 re a receptor in Italy. And they arrived 60, 60 nanoseconds earlier than they should have. And of course, that means they travel faster than the speed of light. And our media, God bless them, instantly portrayed this as the end of science as we know it. Okay? Bless. Um, but it, it doesn't sound like a lot. But the limiting factor is the speed of light. So if these neutrinos, and by the way, neutrinos are um, a particle that have virtually no mass. And they are one of the 16 fundamental particles that go into making up everything in the universe. Okay. We only, they, were, they were predicted by quantum mechanics when well, it's only the last 15 years, 20 years we've been able to observe them. So again, quantum mechanics said we have this particle and we found it eventually when the uh, equipment became sophisticated enough. So is relativity wrong? Well, okay, before I make my defense of Einstein, I want you to know this. There is no absolute in science. We can never prove anything is absolutely right or true in a scientific context. We can only disprove it. Okay? And that's why science is so good. Because even the people that did the experiment published the results with the words, we think this is wrong. Please look at our experiment and tell us what we did wrong. Okay? Where would you get that? Anywhere else in the world? Can you imagine the government put, uh, on the uh, budget yesterday standing up and saying, we think it's wrong, we're not sure where it is, can you please tell us where we went wrong? Yeah? It just never happened. Science is fantastic for that, so it gets people looking and experimenting all the time to try and prove that something is observably correct for the moment, rather than it is absolutely true. Okay? 
So we've said crucial to relativity is the speed of light. So how could the neutrinos move faster? They didn't. Absolutely they didn't. Now, already we've, we've said that human error is accounted for 40 nanoseconds. They forgot to take into account the curvature of the Earth. They didn't know the exact precise locations of the starting point and the end point. So we've already accounted for 40 nanoseconds. Still leaving 20 nanoseconds unaccounted for. Again, doesn't sound like a lot, but it's everything when you talk about relativity. So what else is going on? Okay. When this result was announced, the next morning I was lying in the bath and my brain was calculating all this stuff and I came up with a really weird idea. Okay? And for people that are tweeting, I don't want you to actually jump down my throat because it's an idea that I've already discounted. Okay? Right. So, the speed of light may have changed over the eons since the universe formed. I read a paper, what, what got me thinking about this was, I read a paper that some scientists put forward saying the speed of light may have actually slowed down in the 13.7 billion years that the universe has been in existence. So it's running slightly slower today than it was at the dawn of the universe. Okay? Now given that the whole point of the Large Hadron Collider is to create the conditions of the universe initially, you know, in those moments after the Big Bang, could it be that those neutrinos were travelling according to laws of the dawn of the universe rather than the laws of today? Now, I know relativity says no and all the other things. It was just a really cool idea that I had fun playing with, okay? And I've already discounted it. What's more exciting is that we may finally have found an experiment that gives us evidential... Um, <coughs> proof's not the right word. It gives us evidence, maybe, of a theory called superstrings. Who's heard of superstrings? Yeah? Anyone want to, want to tell me what it is? Right. We've said that relativity and quantum mechanics, we both know so far, seem to be true. As much as we can observe them to be. But they don't work together. There's something missing. The leading contender for that something missing is superstrings. And the idea behind this is that um, when the universe formed, um, these tiny, 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 tiny strings unfold and multiplied at a really incredible rate. And those strings and the way that they vibrate is what decides what the final form will be of any given particle, whether it's oxygen, a planet, us, my hair, such as it is. Yeah? So you've got all that going on. Now, there's a problem. It works. Mathematically, it works and unifies quantum mechanics and relativity really, really nicely. But these strings are so small, we'll never see them. That's problem number one. So we have to look for evidence, you know, traces from other things. But the second thing, and this is, this is fry your brains number two, okay, is that for superstring theory to work, it has to have ten and probably eleven dimensions. How many dimensions do we see, experience? Two. No? Three. Four. And they are? Forward, backwards, sideways, and through time. Yes, and up and down. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, four. Right? So, we don't see the others. And why is that? Well, our perception, the, the argument goes that our perceptions are so basic that we can't see them. And that the superstrings are so small, the other dimensions are actually locked up in the strings. And because we can't see the strings, we can't see the other dimensions. And it could be that these neutrinos, which we know behave erratically anyway, they can change um, their uh, force at random. And they, can, they literally seem to blink in and out of existence when they're travelling from the sun. Maybe they're not travelling faster than time. Maybe they're just being lazy yeah, and taking a shortcut. <coughs> going through one of these other dimensions and reappearing elsewhere in the universe. Okay? So if that's true, then we may have, we may have the first evidence that superstrings is on the right track. <coughs> We've also got brains and bulks and multiple universes to consider as well. Multiple universes is similar to the extra dimensions of superstrings. And this is a concept where... <laughs> Basically, for everything that we do, we can either create an alternate reality that explores every possible uh, version, or we have uh, this universe exists with the conditions right for carbon-based life form. Carbon-based life form is us. us and everything else. Okay. Another universe might have the conditions where there's no life. Another one might have conditions where silicon-based life form is is the standard. Okay. The brain, and this is why we saw that physicists do have a sense of humour, the brain is a construct that has multiple <coughs> dimensions wrapped in it, and we are trapped in 
a 10 dimensional or 11 dimensional brain on a three dimensional platform. Okay? And the X number of brains is often referred to as P. So you have P brains. <laughs> okay. Now I'll do a full talk on this, so I'm not going to lay this point any further. Um, but uh, it's just something else to consider. But let's imagine that none of these are true, that it isn't multiple universes, it isn't super string, and it isn't um, human error. Okay? What does it mean? Well, it means that one of us can get very rich. Because if I had a spaceship that was orbiting the Earth, let's say 99.99998% oh, the speed of light, yeah, and my colleague had a neutrino-powered phone, she could text me the results, I would get them before the lottery numbers were actually drawn, and then I could place my bet using my neutrino phone on the, on the lottery. Okay? I only need a spaceship that will travel at that speed, but you know, that's a minor problem. We could get rich. But of course that opens up the grandfather paradox. Does anyone know what the grandfather paradox is? Yes. Yes? <laughs> Does anyone want to, uh, want to explain what the grandfather paradox is? If you can travel back in time, then you, you can go back and meet your grandfather and accidentally kill your grandfather, so therefore you wouldn't be born and wouldn't exist. Exactly. And this is what freaks out physicists like Hawkins. Um, how could you be born and go back and kill your grandfather if your grandfather is necessary for you being born? It's those kind of paradoxes. And that's why light is one of the forces in the universe that we see as blocking time travel from happening. Okay? So we don't like that. Physicists don't like paradoxes. It, it fries their brains. Okay? So don't invest in the time travel funds yet is what I'm saying. Okay? And this is true. There is an organization in America, and it had to be America. Sorry if you're from America watching at the moment. Um, you can put $10 into this fund, and then in about a thousand years, when we've perfected time technology, we'll come back, and we'll take you from the time reference point that you are historically recorded to have died. We'll rejuvenate you using the science of tomorrow. Okay? Cure your illness, put your head back on, whatever. Yeah? And then you can spend your ill-gotten gains because compound interest will show that in a thousand years that ten dollars could be about six billion dollars. Okay? So some of you are very rich and you can go and spend your money. Absolutely amazing. I mean for ten dollars it's worth a punt, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Okay, so so far already we've covered relativity, speed of light, quantum mechanics, neutrinos, time travel, super strings, brains and pea brains. But there's one thing we haven't done so far, and I know it's the question that you're all asking, right? What about the Higgs boson. And, you're, and I just know that that's what you're thinking, right? What's the Higgs boson? Okay. We've got a problem. <laughs> Another one. Okay. We have this situation where um, we know there are 16 fundamental particles that make up absolutely everything. They combine to make up absolutely everything. And it's all these strange things like quarks and up quarks and beautiful quarks and strange quarks and neutrinos is another one of those particles. And we have something called the standard model which predicts that, but there's a problem in that the mass show that the stand these particles, these 16 particles, have no mass, all of them. And we know that can't be true, because if these 16 particles are what make up the universe, they have to have some mass for things to coalesce. Okay? Without weight or mass, you can't actually create anything, it just falls apart. All right? You can't have gravity without mass. So, the purpose of the Large Hadron Collider is to create the conditions... Oh, I should explain, actually. I'll go back one. So how do these particles get mass? Professor Higgs in the 70s came up with a theory called the Higgs field. And he got the idea from walking through snow one day. Have you tried walking through snow? First few steps are really easy. And then you start to get snow on your shoes and it gets a bit heavier, a bit harder. Yeah? Well, he supposed <coughs> in the dawn of the universe we have the Higgs field. And these particles, or some of them, because photons, for example, went through it harmlessly, some of these particles went through the Higgs field and, and uh, obtained mass. Okay? So, that's great. But the Higgs field has long since dissipated into the universe, seconds after the Big Bang. So how do we prove it? Well, the good news is, is that in physics is a fundamental law that every field has to have a corresponding particle to interact with which is the Higgs boson. And the Higgs boson is a massive particle from which the 16 fundamental particles 
have sprung from. Now again, the Higgs boson has long since disappeared into the universe. So the Large Hadron Collider is trying to recreate those fields, that, that moment, so that it can, for a split second, recreate Higgs boson. And then the experiment will be, if we find traces of it, then we know the standard model is correct. Now here, here's what's interesting. Physicists are even more excited about the prospect of that they don't find the Higgs boson. Because it means they can rip everything up and start all over again. And that's why science is so wonderful. So it's a win-win. We either prove it or we don't, but we don't care. <laughs> because we'll just come up with something else. It's brilliant. And the Large Hadron Collider, for those of you who've been worried about it, I will say this. It shoots particles around a 27 kilometer ring okay, at a speed that means it goes round, those particles go round the ring 11,000 times per second. And they hit one another at the same force as two aircraft carriers travelling at 50 knots, trapped in a space thinner than my hair. Now think about that. That's a lot of power. Okay? So for those of you worried about the end of the earth, black holes eating us up, all that kind of stuff, don't panic. Because basically they've done a risk assessment and everything's okay. Now. <laughs> um, <laughs> the truth is, is that even if it does create a microscopic black hole, we know that black holes evaporate and the black hole would actually evaporate before it could do any real damage. It might make a dent in the mountain, but it won't do anything to the earth. So you can cancel your insurance. Okay, you don't need to worry. Okay. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly was dark matter and dark energy. Again, I've got a new talk that I'm working on, which is called Through a Universe Darkly, which we'll talk about this in detail, so I'm not going to go into any detail about it, but I want you to think about it. Everything that we see in the universe that we can add up accounts for, guess how much, of the universe? Have a guess. Less than 1%. Higher than that, but not much. 5%. 5% of the universe is matter that we can see. So we have dark matter and dark energy. And we know we have to have more matter because otherwise planets and stars won't have coalesced. So we think that accounts for roughly 20% of the universe. So that's 25%. No, it counts for... Hang on, mass was never my strong point. 20%, that's right. So it counts for 20%. We think that... Um, Dark energy, which is the energy that's been in the universe to create... Does everyone, is everyone aware that the universe is expanding slightly faster than it should be? So we think there's some kind of force that's driving that, and that's dark energy. Now, we call them dark because we can't see them. So what is it? Can't tell you. We don't know. Okay? We know what it's not, and we know what dark matter is not, but we don't know what they actually are. So this talk that I'm developing will actually try and explain some of that in more detail. But I wanted to throw that into the mix as well to give you something to go away <coughs> and do some research and the person that can give me the best definition of what they think dark matter is and dark energy is will get a prize. Okay? Right. Now, I have a confession to make. When I was designing this lecture, I had so much stuff in it because so much exciting stuff that I just thought, you guys are going to love it. And then it came in at like two hours long. It was like, oh, I had to strip stuff out, so I stripped out loads of stuff. But what I wanted to leave in, because I knew we'd have some younger members in the audience, was the idea of an invisibility cloak. Whoops. Just go back. The idea of an invisibility cloak, yeah? The technology comes from 2003. So, Harry Potter fans? Yeah? Harry Potter fans, but not willing to admit it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. I have, I, I really hate breaking bad news, um, but I have to break bad news. We will never have an invisibility cloak like we have in um, Harry Potter. I hesitate to say never because that's actually stupid. Well, we won't have it anytime soon, let's put it that way. Because light is made up of constituent parts and each operates at different wavelengths and we cannot make anything fine enough to actually bend um, the shorter wavelengths of light. So we will always have something that's visible. So all these news items that you see about this invisibility club, that's a fix, by the way. They were shining, they're actually broadcasting an image from a camera onto a reflective shirt. It's a bit cheaty, isn't it? But I wanted to put that in because I knew people would ask me, young people would ask me about invisibility clubs. For those that was old enough to remember Romulan spaceships, it means that we can't fly through space clubs either, guys. I'm really sorry. Okay? Um, because it just won't be possible. Right. That's the science covered. Has anyone got any burning 
questions that cannot wait until after the break that they want to ask right now? Or do you want to write them down and try and get them written down and worked out in your head first? What happened before the Big Bang? We don't know. Ah, actually, <laughs> one of the theories, you know I was talking about multiple universes and brains, one of the ideas is, is that the Big Bang is caused when two brains collide. Okay? So this universe came out of the debris of two other universes that existed before us. That's one of the theories. But then you've got the question, well, where did those universes come from? So we don't know. We honestly do not know. And here's another thing that's going to fry your brain. Time didn't exist before the Big Bang anyway. Time came out of the expansion of space. So there was no time before the Big Bang. I can't get my head around that. But I'm told by the likes of Professor Brian Cox and Stephen Hawkins that it's true, so I'll bow to them. Right, so think about your questions you want to ask about the science, and we'll talk about that. I'm now going to make ten predictions. Okay? It's very brave of me. I'm going to do it without a safety net. Okay? Because it's really dangerous. Because, of course, even in the 50s, we thought everything would be atomic now. We'd have atomic planes and flying cars and everything in the house would be atomically powered. And now we know that radiation actually is very harmful. Um, and there's famous mistakes all over. Um, who's heard of Federal Express? Yeah, Fred Smith. Yale University gave his pe business paper a C because they said the idea was unfeasible. Um, the Beatles were rejected because guitar music is on the way out. <laughs> and I am a big Atari fan. Okay, youngsters in the room will not even know who Atari are. I still use Atari computers. That's how big a fan I am. I didn't know this. This is a complete surprise to me. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak went to both Atari and Hewlett Packard and offered them the Apple Mac for free. And they turned it down. Where are Atari now? Gone. Hewlett Packard, struggling. Okay. You'll pack around surviving because they have their fingers in all kinds of medical instrumentation. Okay. So, and my favourite one, of course, is everything that can be invented has been invented. Okay, and that was the US Office of Patents in 1899. <laughs> Wonderful. I love that. So, having said that, let's make some predictions. This one's a fairly safe one, okay? Tablets and mobile devices, devices will outsell desktop computers and TVs by 2022. In fact, folks, it's probably going to happen before. How many of you have got a desktop computer or a big laptop like mine? How many of you have got more than one? How many of you have got more than two? How many of you have got more than three? Get a life. No. <laughs> so, okay, let's ask another question. How many of you have got either a mobile phone or... A tablet device like an iPad or a Kindle. How many of you have got more than one of those devices? Types of devices. How many of you have got more than two of those kinds of devices? Okay, so already the trend is starting. You can see it. There will come a point when we will have more mobile phones and more mobile tablets that we use than we'll have desktop computing and TVs. Because, let's face it, you know, we're doing everything these days on these, aren't we? Right. Okay, so I'm just going to pause for a drink. So I think that's pretty okay. Uh, oh, and by the way, <laughs> for those of us old enough in the room, that is not far off what a mobile computer used to look like. <laughs> right? I'm not joking. They were called luggables. They were awful. And now you've got that, of course. And even ten years ago, we were driving towards this kind of um, uh, facility where we had these computers that would become... <laughs> signals from it interfered in Europe and America. It's great, isn't it? But you could buy one, which is great. But look, even just 60 years ago, 63 years ago, computers may weigh no more than 1.5 tons in the future. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Predicting is so dangerous. Right, 
Prediction number two, and that trend will continue by the way. Prediction number two, a new Cold War will break out in space between East and West by 2015. It's already started China shooting those satellites down, you remember that? This is a, a, a test. The race to colonise the Moon and Mars will actually become the focal point. Now for those of us who are old enough to remember the real Cold War, don't panic. Because it won't get as hot. Simply because corporations will force peace. Corporations will be the ones that conquer space. Governments can't afford it anymore. Okay? Uh, and already there are companies that are set up to actually go out into space, bring an asteroid back from the asteroid belt, put it into near Earth orbit and mine it. Because of course on the Earth we're running out of minerals very quickly, aren't we? So it's bringing new minerals, new, new um, sources um, to the planet. And even NASA on their manned project to Mars have outsourced most of the um, building and design to private contractors and the first step of the, ma of the manned mission to Mars will be a pilot to land on an asteroid. So you can see why private companies are, are helping NASA do that because it will help them perfect their technology to get to the asteroids, land on them and bring them back. Okay? So space will be conquered and it will be by corporations. You've already got, have heard of Galactic One? Yeah, Virgin? What is it? £125,000 for a seat? Yeah? It'll be £12,000 within 15 years. Okay? SpaceX guy, whose name I've forgotten, um, is already saying that he'll have actually a, a holiday hotel on the moon by, in his lifetime. Okay? So it's coming. And he thinks he can also give you a holiday to Mars, a flight to Mars and back, for um, $10,000. I'm sure that's what he said the other day. It's like, what? Is he mad? <laughs> but hey. Right. Position number three. Biointegration with computing hardware becomes normal practice from 2030. Okay, we've already got people like Professor Warwick. This is not him. Okay? <laughs> we've already got people like Professor Warwick who have, who's embedded um, chips and machinery into his body and his house and his car and everything is designed to respond to what he does um, uh, interacting with those machines. Okay. There are some brave people in Japan. Who's, who's seen Star Trek The Borg? And uh, The Borg from Star Trek. <coughs> Come on, there's more people that watch Star Trek than this. Right. <laughs> so, you know they, they, put, they actually have neural implants and they put themselves into, into the mothership, into the hive. We've got some brave people in Japan that have been wearing those for about 10 years. They've actually had them embedded in their brain. And they're trying experiments to see if they can control data on, on digital networks. Okay, I hope their antivirus is up to speed, that's all I can say. <laughs> right. But this combination will increase of man and machine or, or humanity and machine will increase. And that brings me to prediction number four. The Turing test will be beaten by 2035 and there will be a singularity occurrence by 2035. <coughs> now, the Turing test is simple this. Alan Turing came up with this in the 50s. If a machine, a computer, can consistently fool a human into thinking that they're having a conversation with another human, then that machine can, set, can be said to possess intelligence. Okay? <coughs> and so far that test has not been beaten. As a caveat to that, it was beaten, but the humans thought they were talking to someone who was at the age of an eight-year-old. Okay? We haven't so far done it at the age of adults. And that leads into this idea of a singularity occurrence by 2035. Ray Kurzweil came up with this idea and he said that basically the blurring between humanity and machine will become so indistinct that we, it, it will start to become a point where we can no longer differentiate between humans and machines. And another singularity um, principle that he came up with is that we could spontaneously create consciousness within one of those machines. Now think about that. We're not talking about intelligence. We're talking about consciousness, where a machine suddenly says, I think, therefore I am, and I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go out and play. <laughs> now, what do we do then? You know what I'm saying about questions? What do we do? Do we pull the plug in panic? Do we dissect it to find out how it came into being in the first place? Do we actually give it rights and protect it under the Human Rights Act? Because it's aware, it's conscious. Or do we put it to work? for us, as, a, as some kind of digital slave. 
These are all questions, guys, that you people, especially here, you need to be asking because you need to control the development of the laws and regulations around this kind of stuff. Okay? Do a better job than we have. And it is true that AI is becoming more and more sophisticated. This is how. How learns through experience. He's been learning for 20 years. He's now got the mental capacity of a 12-year-old. Okay? He's learning through experience. These little blighters here, this just reminds me of Skynet so much, right? <laughs> These things are flying themselves, and they're also working out spatial coordinates so they can fly in formation without any human intervention. There's no remote control going on here. These things are working it out themselves. This is a fish, robot, mimicking a real fish for swimming, trying to work out what's the best way to swim. Learning through experience. I can't do that. Juggle. <laughs> this robot learned through hand-eye coordination. Artificial intelligence routines again. Toys are becoming more and more sophisticated. I know we've got a demo coming up um, somewhere in the break, probably, of a toy. But these things are, are learning. They interact with you as the owner. They learn your moods, believe it or not. And they act differently according to that mood, probably because they don't want to get kicked. But you know what I mean. <laughs> so you've got all that. And then, of course, we've got things like Actroid, who's going to come up any minute. <coughs> now watch this. Actroid suddenly realises there are people standing here. Watch. Did you see it? That wasn't, that wasn't someone remotely controlling the robot. The robot suddenly realised there were people in front of her and started, and she engaged with them. Okay? It's becoming more and more sophisticated, more and more realistic. And the future really is here now. Um, we have a surprise, courtesy of, I should say, iRobot, who are absolutely brilliant. I just sent them an email on the off chance, look, we're doing this talk, any chance we can have one of your fantastic robot, robot hoovers. And they sent it without any problem at all. How about that? So, here she goes. Now, these hoovers are incredible, because you can program to come on, and uh, they will over at certain times, and they will, after a while they will work out the dimensions of a room and, and work out the most optimal way to actually hoover that room up. We tried it in the office yesterday and we just couldn't believe it. It's absolutely brilliant. Okay, so... So at the moment it's hoovering up. You can also program it so that it just sits there and monitors the dust level in the room. And at some point we'll say, you filthy people, you haven't moved up in here for ages, I'm going to clean up after you. And off it goes. How amazing is that? No, sadly not. Sadly not. Not yet. But I'm sure I robot are working on that. self cleaning over. So I'll just turn her off. Now, believe it or not, you can even buy things like Mickey Mouse hats for these things. There's a whole industry going around them. Five million, I think, at last count, of these in, in the marketplace. Yeah, Absolutely brilliant, and, and thank you, Iroh, for sending that. Um, <coughs> and if it disappears because of quantum phasing from the box that's got to send it back, I'm really sorry. Okay? Right. So, uh, we might do that calculation later just to prove that it's possible. Prediction number five, oil companies and will rebrand as fuel organisations and they'll merge with energy providers from 2025 and we'll start to see fusion technology by 2040. Okay? You better believe that oil companies and energy companies are invested in coal fusion technology. Why are they doing that? Why do we think that they're doing that? Even though we know oil is not going to be the cash cow for much longer, why would they invest in something that is effectively free energy once we perfect the science? Sorry? Power. Yeah? They've got the power, they've got the knowledge, they've got it. And what, what do companies do to protect outputs that come from research and development? Patent it. Patent it. So we then have to pay a license fee to use the energy that comes from water. Okay, see why I want you guys to start asking questions? I want this changing. We should not be paying for energy by the year 2040. Energy should be free. Okay? Start a movement. Okay? Go on that hurled down shell and BP. Right. So there we go with that. Prediction number six. Holographic and TV game rooms by 2045. Total immersion. Okay? So right now, we go into the room, we turn the telly on and the, and the game's console, yeah? 
In the future, you'll go into the room, and the room is the television and the games console. Okay? And you will sit in it, and eventually the technology will develop to such a point that you won't only just be in it, you'll be interacting with it. Okay? Sony are painting to the device that uses sound waves to actually stimulate the brain so that you feel that you can smell certain things. So imagine that you're in a game and you're playing a western, you'll be able to smell the gunpowder. Yeah? How cool would that be? PlayStation 10, probably. Yeah? Obviously, that would be versatile, but they don't need to come to school. Ah! Good point, because... <laughs> right? This kind of technology will also be developed. What's the most expensive part of education? Wages. No. For those of the watching the webcast, this building is absolutely amazing. The facilities are absolutely incredible, but it costs a packet. Okay? So what we will see once this technology really starts to develop is the idea that we'll have virtual classrooms. I'm sorry guys, but you'll actually be going to school at home. Okay? <laughs> so, right? And it'll mean that um, education authorities can do away with all these big buildings and just have a small drop-in centre for those students that just need a bit of interaction every now and again. Yeah? And already, a, a company in Cambridge are piloting technology that actually shows holographic teachers, a virtual learning environment with holographic teachers, 3D in front of the student, for those students that are too ill to actually go into school on a regular basis. It's coming. And then you've got to ask the question, what happens to all the teachers? Yeah? So, again, big change coming. Huge paradigm shift. Right? Really frightening stuff. And of course, on the gaming side, we've got the danger. I mean, who heard about the woman uh, a couple of years ago who had her children taken off her because she got so lost in Second Life, the pets starved to death, and the children nearly did as well? Mm. Right? Imagine being in a room where everything's real around you. Why would you come out, especially if it's better than your life? So you've got all those kind of issues that you need to talk about as well. Position seven. Brain functions will be augmented and replaced with custom implants by 2050. Hippocampus replacements will be standard operation in 2035. Anyone know what the hippocampus is? Yeah? Is that someone's family brain? It is, but what particular? Do you know? You can't remember? There's a clue. <laughs> uh, the hippocampus is responsible for sorting, sifting, storing, and tagging memories. Okay? So, We've already successfully experimented on mice where we've replaced the organic hippocampus with a digital hippocampus and the mice have functioned okay. <coughs> okay. So, what's the first thing that starts to go when we get a degenerative brain disease? It's memory. Okay. So again, if we can start to replace that, we can mitigate against some of the worst effects of a degenerative brain disease. There is an issue, and this again comes back to asking questions. Yeah? There is an issue. The hippocampus also serves another purpose. <coughs> it enables us to deal with trauma by forgetting certain inst instances or downgrading the um, vivid recall of that incident. If we replace it with a digital device that actually has everything in true digital colour at an instant, then that's going to have profound psychological effects on us as a species. So again, we need to ask questions about the development of that but it will become standard operation for 2035. Star Trek style replicators and teleporters by the year 2050. How many of you think this is really science fiction? It could never possibly happen in a million years. It's got news for you guys, it's happening now. We've already successfully teleported a photon of light uh, in 2002. We did that and we've re repeated the experiment. And this is the mass, just to prove it. I'm sure you can all follow that. It works on a principle called quantum entanglement. What we've discovered is that we can transfer data and information from one uh, atom to another through quantum entanglement. So in effect, we teleport. Okay? And there are companies already working on this, and we might have it by 2050, if not even sooner. The biggest company invested in teleportation technology is IBM. And they are so sure that they will have a product by the year 2050, they started advertising it 12 years ago. Now think about that. I did this presentation, or a similar presentation, to some leaders from the airline industry in the year 2000. Okay? And as a bit of fun, I thought, 
I'm put in about IBM's research into teleportation. And the table just instantly split down the middle. Half of them going, oh, it's Star Trek, it'll never happen. The other half saying, 30% of our revenues come from freight. Okay? So if someone's going to suddenly come up with a desktop teleporter that can send half you know, the, our freight, we're going to lose so much money, it's not even funny. And I actually recommended that they actually bought into these organizations investing in teleportation technology. They didn't do it. So, ha oh, ha, you're in danger now, guys, because you haven't got any money to invest now. So, we've got this situation where we've got the new technology coming that's going to, again, create a huge paradigm shift. Okay? So, this isn't a prediction. This is a hope, a wish. Conglomerates are doomed forever. Money becomes a thing of the past. Productivity is replaced by contribution. And learning becomes the activity of leisure. Okay? This ties into some fundamental principles that I have about the fact that learning is the most powerful tool we possess. We must continue to learn and we must push that envelope at all times. So if you go to bed on the night and you haven't learned anything new, get an encyclopedia off the shelf and read one of the entries. It's really important that we continue to learn. Contribu contribution and productivity. How many of us have had to fill in a tick sheet because we've had to do we've had to say that we've had that output, we've had that output, we've had that output. There's absolutely nothing sustainable in that at all, and yet that is what we've paid on, that is what we're focused on. Contribution is about sustainability. It's about what can we do as an organization or an individual that will make things better for the company, the clients, the community, the planet, humanity, in the long run. And that's the shift we need to make. That's what I hope will happen. And again, that comes from you guys asking the right questions. Okay? The young people in the room. Because we, with both, too old now to do anything about it. <laughs> One prediction that I am sure about is we will find life elsewhere in the universe in my lifetime. Okay? Whether or not it'll look like that uh, alien that was on the slide there, I don't know. But before we go on to that discussion, maybe we don't even have to go into outer space to find the alien life. This was captured by a deep sea oil rig. Have you ever seen anything like that? <coughs> Isn't that astonishing? There's 70% of the world's oceans that we still haven't explored. I think about that one. Right. Now this is, for those of you who've seen my alien talk, you'll know that one of the things that I do is I debunk conspiracy theories. Okay? I can't explain this one. And I'm hoping that someone might be able to help me. This is a tether. It's kilometers long. It broke free from a shuttle that was trying an experiment with telecommunications fibers in space. And the astronauts, while they were watching this thing float away from them, seemed oblivious to all these things flying around, but the camera caught them. Now, NASA have said that there are actually ice crystals on the lens. A reasonable explanation, yeah? Except that, watch. When it comes to zoom in a minute, where is it? It actually goes behind the tether. If there are ice crystals on the lens, it would always be in front. I can't explain that. What are they? Are they... Interdimensional beings, UFOs, some kind of strange entity that floats around in space doing absolutely nothing. We don't know. I love that. But I think we will find life in the universe. Um, <coughs> and we'll probably find it in our solar system. It won't be sophisticated life. It could be dead bacteria on Mars. It could be a very basic life form on the moons of Jupiter. Okay? Now, think about that. If we find life on a planet within our own solar system, what does that mean for life in the universe? Okay, it means we must be teeming with life. And then as a species, we have to then start to reevaluate who we are and what we are. Okay? Right. It's now time for a break. You'll be pleased to know.